it's a scientific fact that humans are part of Earth's ecological systems. We're just one of many species that inhabit this planet. And if you think about it, how many times during the day do you go outside in nature? How often do you think about nature and the processes that drive our earthly home? If you're typical, the answer is not very often. We build our environment and our homes to buffer us from nature and the things that we don't like about nature. If it's hot outside, we turn the air conditioning on. If it's cold outside, we turn the heat on. And if we need water, no longer do we have to go to the stream, but a magical pipe brings that water to us. And when we're done in the bathroom, an equally magical pipe takes that waste away. And if that a spider happens to cross our threshold, we quickly squash it and dispose of it to keep that critter away from us. Enter into our story, Dr. Thomas McBride. McBride was a noted scientist. He was an expert in slime molds. He was also a gifted teacher and the 10th president of the University of Iowa. He was the kind of teacher that people loved. They clamored to take his classes. He transformed the, the content for them. And he was concerned about his students. He felt like they didn't connect to nature, that they didn't really understand nature the way that they should. And why was that? If you think about the earliest humans and the way that they understood science, they would observe Earth's processes, think about them, communicate them to one another, learn, share, repeat. But as we changed our educational models, we brought the students inside. We set them at straight rows of desks and we gave them books to read, we maybe talked about science, maybe showed them a movie, and if they were very lucky, we took them outside for an hour. Well, what impact did that have on the student? Students we know and humans need nature. Science tells us that nature reduces blood pressure, it reduces anxiety and depression, that children, when they play in nature, are more collaborative and cooperative. So it seems to reason that the reverse would be true that when you pull students out of nature, they're more anxious and depressed. What impact does that have on the learning? Well, if we think about Earth's processes and the things that drive our world, they're interconnected. The chemistry and biology and physics are interwoven, yet the educational models separated them. We teach them in individual subjects. We reduce them to their essential pieces, and no longer do we teach them to interrelate. So the model falls apart. What impact does that have on society? Well, science became something to learn and quickly forget if you didn't need to use it every day. Technology became the panacea and the replacement for understanding science. What time is it? Look at your phone. Is it going to rain? Look at your phone. Do I need directions to find my house? Look at my phone. So if we're trying to understand the world, we no longer have that intuitive knowledge. We have to use technology to tell us about it. At the same time, when we take humans out of nature, when we pull them away from that, we create a fear mechanism. If I don't know if I can eat that mushroom because it might make me sick, or if I don't know if I can touch that plant because it's going to give me a rash, or what is that rustling in the bush behind me, I'm more fearful of nature. I'm less competent to be in nature. So that humans lose that connection and become more fearful in a vicious cycle. Well, let's go back to Thomas McBride. He sees that with his students and he decides, I'm going to change that. He looks to a mostly undeveloped lake in Northwest Iowa. And there he purchases five acres of land and a summer cottage and decides to create the study of nature in nature. He christens it Iowa Lakeside Laboratory. And it's a completely different model of education. No longer is it sitting in a classroom, but it's outside. It's hands-on. It's immersive. Nature doesn't provide science to us in small, digestible chunks. It forces us to think about it in its complexity, in its overwhelmingness. And it makes us think about it in ways that we have to lose control of the subject matter. Let's say, for example, we're going to go for a walk in the prairie. We want to look at the prairie plants and maybe see a prairie animal. But in the horizon, we see this looming storm. Suddenly, the control of the lesson has been taken away from us. And now we must understand it in the way that nature wants to present it to us. And if you're like most Midwesterners, you're going to stand there and watch to see if a tornado drops out of this cloud. 
Some people might go take shelter. But in either case, nature has taken control. The other part about the study of nature and nature is it meets students where they best learn. We know that some students are visual. They need to see things. Other students are more auditory. They need to hear. And still others are kinesthetic. So if I were to show you this word and say, jump, my brain explodes with all the things that I'm learning at the same time. Much the same way in the study of nature, if I'm outside and I start to hear those bird songs and I see those birds in the distance and I'm walking up that hill to watch that bird and it's a lot steeper and I'm huffing and puffing because of it, that memory is forever burned in my brain. I can't just walk away from it. If we think then about the other aspect of the study of nature and nature, it's authentic inquiry. And what I mean by that is that inquiry is the process of asking questions. And their authentic nature is when we don't know the answer to that. I'm asking a question that I don't know or the teacher doesn't know the answer to. And it's more powerful than a prescribed way of doing inquiry. It works for small children all the way to adults. So that I can take a four-year-old outside and maybe that rainstorm has passed through and our original intention was to look at the prairie. But that rainstorm means that hundreds of worms are now on the sidewalk. Immediately, the four-year-olds are going to be captivated by that. And they will stop and they'll look at those worms and they'll think, where did they come from? From the sky? From the ground? Did someone tip a bucket over? Invariably, one child will pick up that worm and feel its wriggling bodies in its fingers. It will smell that earthly smell. And still other children may actually try to eat that worm. Now let's take that same child and fast forward them to a college age student. If they've had that experience of learning nature and nature, they've embedded those memories and they've built the competence to be in nature. They're not afraid to pick up the turtle. They're not afraid to do the things in nature that give them a more robust education. And they'll look at that turtle and the colorations and they'll feel that shell and they'll understand their local environment in a very intense way in a way that allows them to take that information and expand it to maybe a regional or national scale, and hopefully even a global scale, to think about the complex issues that are facing us, to understand the world and all its messiness, and to think more broadly across time and space. But Thomas McBride knew that education was more than just gaining knowledge. It was about transformation of the student. It was said of Thomas McBride that his study of botany was more than the study of plants. It was life and truth and beauty. Thomas McBride wanted his students to be so deeply connected to nature as if an oak tree held fast to the ground by its roots. The students reaching their branches out and gathering new experiences and new knowledge as the leaves would pull in sunlight. But the funny thing about trees is while they seem to be solitary individuals, they secretly and silently support one another. Research has shown that their root systems share nutrients, they provide water to one another, and that if one tree is attacked by an insect, it releases a chemical that then alerts the other trees to be aware of the tiny invaders. So too is the study of nature in nature. It connects us not only to nature, but to each other. Generations later, that little field campus on Northwest Iowa's West Okaboji is continuing to create these little acorns of students that grow into great oaks of knowledge. The study of nature and nature doesn't just connect us to nature, it connects us to each other. It builds community. Our final story with Thomas McBride is that he was brought to the state of Iowa by Samuel Calvin, who was the first state geologist. Calvin was McBride's mentor and teacher. Together with their scientist friends, they traveled the state exploring, learning, sharing, and teaching. When Calvin died, McBride was despondent. He considered giving up teaching, a profession he so deeply loved. And it was the community of students and people that he had touched that encouraged him to continue, which he did until his death. Generations later, that little field campus, Iowa Lakeside Laboratory on the shores of West Okaboji, is still creating these little acorns of 
students that become oaks of knowledge, connecting deeply to each other as well as to nature. And it is my fervent hope that all students should have the opportunity to study the nature of nature and be profoundly transformed. Thank you.